Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You have a, uh, my name is Hugh Hewitt. I'm the uh, director of the library, the president of the library. Mike Elsey is here, who's the actual director of the library somewhere. I am great to, great, grateful for all of you to be here this evening. It's quite a big crowd, and we have two very distinguished guests. Uh, I would like to first introduce Dean Matt Parlow, who is the dean of the Fowler School of Law at Chapman University, and he will be asking Justice Gorsuch the questions tonight, and the Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch. Please welcome our guests. standing for the presentation of the colors. Almost got you there. Presentation of the colors and the singing of the national anthem. The blue guard, the blue diamond. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Please be seated. We have a lot of special guests tonight for a special conversation. I just want to recognize, especially, four members of our board of directors. Uh, we have Sandy Quinn, Ken Kachigan, and his wife Meredith. We have John Barr somewhere. I don't know where John is. And we're right there, John. Thank you for coming out tonight. And um, our newest member of our board, uh, Chapman University President Daniele Strupa. Daniele and his wife, Lisa Sparks, Dean of the School of Communications, is right here as well. Uh, Mike Antonovich, former supervisor forever of Los Angeles County, looking very dapper here. Mike Elzey, who is the sixth director of the library. If you're in here, Mike, I know you may have had to, to run. Thank you for being here. Sandy Quinn, I've already mentioned. Judge James Rogan, are you here somewhere? I didn't, I thought you came in. No, but Andy Guilford, Judge Guilford is here. Judge, say hello. 
And all who are members of the President's Society, thank you. You're in for a great conversation. With no further ado, Dean Parlow. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my goal tonight is to engage the justice in the conversation that covers a lot of the themes in his book and also gives you a little bit of a sense of who he is as a, a man and a, a father and a, a Westerner. Um, let me start with this, Justice. Um, your life clearly changed when uh, you went from even being a judge to a justice. Can you maybe tell a couple stories that might uh, illuminate that change and shift uh, for the audience? Sure. Uh, first of all, can I just say thank you? Thank you for having me here. It is a great privilege to be here. And it's really nice being west of the Mississippi. <laughs> being in this uh, recreation of the East Room is uh, <coughs> difficult for me <laughs> uh, because that's where my life changed on national TV um, prime time <laughs> surprise announcement of my nomination uh, happened in, in the East Room. Uh, and I think, yeah, my life, my life totally changed. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories uh, that kind of illustrate how it did. So the night of the nomination, we had, we had to sneak out of our home in Niwot, Colorado. And that's a whole other story. And then we had to sneak into the White House and not be seen, which is hard to do. <laughs> we went in through the kitchen entrance in the basement. There are still pockmarks in the marble from the War of 1812 down there. <laughs> Pretty neat. Then uh, the president very graciously allowed me to use the Lincoln bedroom as my office for the day. And I wrote my remarks for the evening on a desk where there's a copy of the Gettysburg Address. Right next door to the room that uh, President Nixon used as his study. It was right off that Lincoln bedroom. And the president, knowing that my wife is a, an immigrant uh, from England, uh, gave her use of the queen's bedroom across the hall. <laughs> And he allowed her one phone call. <laughs> now that's not fair. His people allowed her one phone call to her folks back home in England. And they thought, couldn't do any harm. England's five hours ahead. They don't care anyway. <laughs> the secret's safe. I couldn't tell anybody, almost anybody. And so Louise calls up her dad and says, Dad. It's going to be Neil. And he says, honey, I've stayed up late to watch your American news. And I'm telling you that there's this fellow, a dear friend of mine, who's in a car, and he's gassing up at a gas station in Pennsylvania, and he's driving down toward Washington. I hate to break it to you, it's not going to be Neil. <laughs> In-laws, eh? All right, Louise says, Dad, I'm in the Queen's bedroom and Neil's in the Lincoln bedroom. I'm pretty sure it's going to be Neil. <laughs> Not to be outdone, he responded, Darling, this is President Trump. The other guy's probably in a room down the hall. <laughs> Everything changed. I mean, I, I went from a very quiet, happy, anonymous life in Colorado as a judge to uh, being recognized everywhere. And the loss of, loss of anonymity was really something I did not expect. And I didn't realize what a loss it was until people post videos of you slurping spaghetti in a restaurant from across, <laughs> across the room and post it on the internet. Uh, and I, for a while, felt a real loss. Uh, how, but how, how about the poor milkman? Well, well I got, oh, the milkman, all right, well, I'll get to, uh, is it, all right, the milkman. <laughs> uh, 
So um, we get a call one morning back home in Colorado during the confirmation process that our milkman, who's been a wonderful milkman for many years, will no longer be servicing our home. And my wife asks, something happened. And, and, and she, she goes out to the marshals who are guarding the house. I said, did something happen last night? I said, well, yes, ma'am, there was an incident. And it comes out very slowly, very slowly, that the milkman had driven up to the house. A, a van had come up to the house at 4 a.m. in the morning. Somebody jumped out with white containers and started running toward the house. <laughs> And Louise gingerly asks, did, did something happen to the milkman? <laughs> Marshall's reply, yes, ma'am, he did end up in the prone position. <laughs> <laughs> and we delivered one of those chocolate box mountain things to the poor milkman. He still wasn't going to come back. <laughs> so every, uh, everything changed. <laughs> Everything changed, but, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, you, there were some painful moments and things like that, funny things and sad things, um, but there were gifts too, you know, and God takes something away. If you look hard enough, he often gives you a, a gift in return. And the converse of losing my anonymity was, was being witness now to the American people and their love of country and of our Constitution in our courts on a daily basis. People come up to me every day and just want to wish me luck. Want to say they love this country and this constant. They may say, I love this president and I love you, or they may say, I didn't vote for this president, but I wish you well. I have not had a mean word spoken to my face since I've become a justice. Now, social media is another thing. Maybe, maybe my favorite story along those lines in, involves, I was flying back and forth between D.C. and Colorado all the time. I, I, I got pneumonia at one point during the process. I just so much flying. And it's pretty, feeling pretty low. And I was sitting next to a little girl, probably about six years old. And we started encountering some turbulence. And she got a little nervous, and she leaned over to me, and she said, would you mind if we held hands? And so we held hands for about 20 minutes. And after the turbulence cleared, she said, thank you. Would you like to draw? <laughs> she didn't know. She didn't care who I was. And we drew for the next two hours. <laughs> and I was anonymous again. And it was great. And it just, just I, you know, it was like my daughter's at that age. And, and of course, her mom who's sitting behind us, did recognize me eventually at, at, after the flight. And about two weeks later, I got in the mail a thank you note. And it was a drawing by the little girl of two stick figures in front of an airplane holding hands. <laughs> That's America to me. That's what I've been able to witness. You wrote a terrific book. I really enjoyed it. A Republic If You Can Keep It. It's a really interesting title. It comes from a famous quote. Do you mind providing uh, the context for the quote and why you picked it as a title? Sure. So it's, uh, as you all know, the story is Ben Franklin is coming out of the Constitutional Convention. And someone asks him, what kind of government are you proposing? And he says, a republic if you can keep it. And republics have kind of a checkered record in our history books, right? They tend not to last very long. Our written constitution is still already the oldest written Republican constitution in history. Think about that, in all of human history. So a, re a republic requires an educated citizenry, right? Thomas Jefferson said, if you expect an ignorant people will remain free in a republic, you wish for something that has never happened and never will. It requires a people who are able to talk 
and listen, to tolerate as well as expect tolerance, civics, civility, right? Um, and during the confirmation process, and who understand their government, who care about their government, who love their government, who want to help run their government. That's what a republic requires, right? The word republic, Latin, means a thing of the people, of the people. Um, and, and during the confirmation process, which was a very interesting process, <laughs> I, I became a little concerned that some of these things are lost or in danger of being lost. How many people wanted me to promise to rule this way in a case? What judge would rule, promise how they'd rule in a case? They talk about my record. If I'd ruled for a particular party, they said I must have liked that kind of party. Or if I ruled against a person, they must, I must dislike that kind of party. What kind of judge rules for the people they like and against those they dislike? And so I wanted to talk about that. You know, uh, my predecessor, Justice Scalia's confirmation hearing, he smoked a pipe. My old boss, Byron White, for whom I clerked, his, his confirmation hearing lasted 15 minutes. <laughs> so did my first one to the Tenth Circuit. <laughs> Second one was a little different. So I, I, I wanted to talk about some of those things. You began the book by talking about something you just referenced, which was sort of civics and civic education. Uh, do you mind giving some reflections on its importance and, and, and why you kind of lead with that in the book? Yeah, it, 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 it grew out of the confirmation process. And then I started saying, well, you know, gosh, where is this coming from? This, this radical disconnect about understanding of judges. As, as kind of politicians. That's just not my lived experience in the law. It's not how I saw great lawyers. It's not how I saw great judges. And then so I started doing some looking into it. You know today, pretty reliable evidence that America, only about a third of the American people can name the three branches of their government. Another third can only name one branch of their government. Only 30% of millennials think it's important to live in a democracy, according to public polling, down from 70% not that long ago. And 10% of the American public apparently believes that Judith Scheinman serves on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> now, those of you who are giggling know who I'm talking about. That's Judge Judy. <laughs> now, I happen to like Judge Judy, but she is not one of my colleagues. You also talk a lot about civility. That's just an, an important topic you've been talking a lot about lately. Um, share your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, I, I don't know when we stop teaching civics, but we have. And I don't know when we stop talking about civility or when it became a bad word, right? As if you're not strong enough if you believe in civility because the ends justify the means. Right? My public policy goals justify being unkind, uncivil to one another. I don't even know if we use the word manners anymore. I think the Supreme Court of the United States is a pretty good role model on this stuff, actually. That's part of why I'm here. Right? We get along. We do it the old-fashioned way. Um, every time we meet, we shake hands. 36 handshakes, it takes a while. And we do it every time we gather to do work for argument, for conference. We eat lunch together regularly. Every argument day, every conference day, there's lunch in the dining room together. Bring your own. It's pretty simple. We work for the government. <laughs> we don't talk business. Justice Breyer's grandchildren seem to know every knock-knock joke ever given, <laughs> and he shares them with us. <laughs> we play practical jokes with one another. Justice Sotomayor showed up one day wearing a pinstripe robe <laughs> with the New York Yankees logo on it. 
lined up to get ready to go into the courtroom. I thought some of my colleagues were about to have a heart attack. <laughs> they will remain nameless. And finally, one of them said, Sonia, are you really going to wear that into the courtroom? And she said, no, I was just waiting for you to ask. <laughs> um, it's a human place where people listen, are kind to one another, tolerate one another. Do we have dis Of course we have disagreements, but that's what makes a republic strong. That's what makes a court strong. It's a marketplace of ideas. It's supposed to be a little raucous. An elbow can be thrown here or there. Fine. At the end of the day, we're friends. At the end of the day, we enjoy each other. So I think the court's a pretty good model on this stuff. My, my, recently, I, there's another tradition. that We have to welcome a new justice with a welcome dinner. And the junior justice has to do that. And uh, Justice Kagan threw a fabulous welcome party for me and my wife. My wife loves Indian food. And so she brought in an Indian chef she knew. And uh, he, he was fantastic. It was a great meal. I had to do Justice Kavanaugh's. And I've known Justice Kavanaugh for 40 years. He's an old friend, great judge. The one thing I know about Justice Kavanaugh is a meat and potatoes kind of guy. <laughs> so dinner was going to be boring. <laughs> I got to spice it up somehow. So I thought about. What does he love? He loves the Washington Nationals. He's a huge baseball fan. And their mascots are those giant foam-headed presidents. And they run around. And so we went online, and I found out you can rent them. And, and so I brought everybody down to the Great Hall of the Supreme Court of the United States after dinner. They thought they were going in for a string quartet, I'm pretty sure. And I handed the Chief Justice a checkered flag so he could referee it, and they ran around the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> now, I'll be honest, as much as we get along, I wasn't sure how that one was going to go over. <laughs> but we have a lot of baseball fans, and it turned out just fine. Um, so uh, civility, um, we, need, we, we need to be able to listen to one another. You know, and it's, George Washington had to write down by hand all the rules the Jesuits proposed in 1595 for civilized behavior and decent company. It's a good book. It's still out. Still buy it. And I can't remember what rule number it is, but my favorite, and they're funny, some of them, too. I think it's rule 83 or something like that. Do not speak so vehemently or approach your opponent so closely that you bedew the other man's face with your spittle. <laughs> Pretty good rule. My teenagers would say, say it, don't spray it. <laughs> you know, we, we don't need all those rules. And, and, uh, but but, but he, he, he was taught manners. And for a republic to work, for the marketplace of ideas, for our raucous republic to get along, we have to learn how to live with one another again. And for me, if I could pass along one rule, you all know it already, though. Everyone in this room I'm not worried about. But Louise's grandmother taught it to me. And it's simple. She said, you're going to have many regrets in life. Sorry, can't help it. It's going to happen. There are going to be things you say, things you've done, that you will regret having done, said. And there are going to be things you wish you hadn't said and hadn't done, plenty of them. But the one thing in life you will never regret is being kind. I think that's all we need to remember. What comes through very clearly in the book is your love of country and your appreciation for the brilliance of our founding fathers and the government that they created. You talk a lot about separation of powers. Can you reflect upon that constitutional principle and its importance? Can I do one thing first? Please. So I don't want you to think I'm pessimistic about this stuff, the civics or the civility stuff. I'm not. I'm optimistic, OK? And let me give you three good reasons, all right? They're sitting in the audience, all right? They're three of my clerks. We've got wonderful young people who love this country, all right? My co-authors are collaborators, my law clerks, two of them. David Fetter, he's a 
Californian. Are you here, David? I don't know. He's in here somewhere. All right. Family? Half of them? Mexican immigrants. The other half? Holocaust survivors. He went to Cal Poly to save his pennies. His dream was to go to Harvard Law School. He got in. Graduated first in his class. My other collaborator, Jane Nitze, her family escaped communism. Owes a lot to the two presidents from California for that. Czechoslovakia. She got into Harvard. Graduated with degrees in statistics, physics, law, and clerk for not just me, but also Sonia Sotomayor. And then there's this fella here, Eric Tung. I got four I got to brag on tonight. First generation Chinese American. Top of his class from the University of Chicago. Clerk for Justice Scalia and me. Toby Young, right, right behind him. First Native American law clerk at the United States Supreme Court. They know this country, they know its separation of powers, they know how to be civil, they know their civics. I can't wait for the future of this country in their hands. All right, separation of powers. You want to talk about separation Please. of powers? All right, we can talk about separation of powers. All right. Everybody knows what the First Amendment's about. I get to lecture all the time about how important that is. <laughs> the Fourth Amendment, we all know that, right? The Second Amendment, some even can name the Third Amendment. Fine. We all know the Bill of Rights. They're great. But James Madison was brilliant, and he wrote the Bill of Rights, and he thought it wasn't necessary. He thought if you got the structure of government right, that's what would keep us free. He knew that the promises in the Bill of Rights were just that, promises on a piece of paper. And like any promise, like any good contract, its worth depends upon the capacity to enforce it, right? So I look around the world, and if I'm honest with myself, there are other better bills of rights in the world than ours. My favorite is North Korea's. <laughs> Listen, wait, wait for it. <laughs> it promises everything our Bill of Rights promises and more. Right to free health care, right to a free education. My personal favorite, though, is the right to relaxation. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure how that's working out for the political prisoners there. <laughs> but the point is obvious. When all the power resides in one man's hands, or one set of hands, those promises are worthless. Worthless. So the separation of powers. I am one-ninth of one-third of our federal government, which is one-half of our sovereignty, split with the states. Brilliant. I can't do anything. I'm a vote, right? I'm a bill just sitting here on Capitol Hill. <laughs> I'm a vote. I'm only a vote, right? One, one person has a limited amount of power in our separation of powers. Now, everybody knows this, or this room knows it. Most people don't, it turns out. But how does this contribute to your liberty? All right. I, I saw this. I knew all this academic stuff and high school civics, but I didn't appreciate Madison's brilliance until I became a judge. And I started to see what happens when the separation of powers goes ignored in our own time. And if you don't believe me that it happens, let me tell you a few stories, okay? What happens when judges start to make stuff up and act as legislators, okay? Uh, there's a case called Dred Scott. It's the first time the Supreme Court of the United States departed from the original meaning of the Constitution and started to make stuff up. And they held that a white person has the right to own a black person in the territories of the United States guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment's Due Process Clause. Due process guarantees that right. Now they thought, like a good legislator, that doing this, making it up a little bit, would help a problem of the day. They were well-intentioned, I think, in their own minds. They were trying to avert the Civil War. 
But judges make for rotten politicians. And instead of averting the Civil War, they contributed to it. So that's what happens when judges start to act like legislators. What happens when legislators give away their legislative power to the executive branch? Another problem happens. Madison knew that the most dangerous part of government is the capacity to restrict liberty, the power to make new laws restricting your natural freedoms. And so he wanted it to be really hard. Everyone complains lawmaking is hard. Madison, if you were today, would have jumped up and down and said, great. That was the whole point. Two houses of Congress, responsive to different electorates at different times. Modern political science has established that system, forget about the rules of the Senate or anything like that. That system itself creates a supermajority requirement for any new law. The result is that minorities are at the fulcrum of legislative power. They hold the sway, which way it's going to go, up or down. That's what was going to protect minority rights against incursions by the tyranny of the majority, Madison thought. That was going to, was going to be a public process, and minorities were going to have the key to the legislative process. OK, what happens when you take that very public process, the people and their representatives are involved, and hand it over to the executive branch? Well, one of two things happens. One, the president can do whatever the heck he wants very quickly. He doesn't have to consult 435 members of Congress. You're going to get a lot more law. It's going to come a lot more quickly. And it's going to be a lot more major tyranny of the majority problems. You've elected yourself a king for four years. Or maybe worse still, what if the president can't even control the bureaucracy that's making the rules? You have a bureaucrat in Washington, unresponsive to anybody making new laws. Now, if you think I'm making it up, let me give you a case that'll show you what happens. I had it in the 10th Circuit. It's in the book. All this is in the book. Caring Hearts versus Burwell. Small nursing facility. Provide home health care to seniors. And they were accused of Medicare fraud and fined $800,000 by the bureaucracy for violating the rules. Sounds very serious. Puts you out of business serious. Years of litigation, churn, churn, churn. Anyone be involved in litigation how long it takes these days? Yeah, all right. And guess what? It turns out that they had abided every single rule that the bureaucracy had in place at the time they provided their services. The bureaucracy was so confused that it accused them of violating rules that it didn't create until years later. Even the government can't keep up. Okay, and Madison foresaw this. He said. Too little written law, you don't know what is a danger. You don't, you don't know what your rule, rights and obligations are. Too much written law, and it becomes like a paper blizzard. I asked my law clerks, how many federal criminal laws are there today? And the answer is, well, in the statute books, there are about 4,000. That's, that's OK. That doesn't count the state laws, right? I said, oh, fine, but how many of these rules have delegated legislative authority to the agencies? How many have they created? The agencies created. And the answer is, we don't know. We used to know, about 20 years ago, it was about 300,000. But it keeps churning. And no one, not even the professors, can keep up. All right, that's what happens. When, when you give away legislative authority to the executive. What about the other angle? And then I'll shut up about the separation of powers. What, up, what happens when you give away the judicial power to another branch? All right. We have, we, we, we have rules now where if you're a veteran and you've applied for benefits, or you're an immigrant, and you seek entry into this country under the laws, and a judge thinks you have a winning argument under the law, under the statute, as written. He cannot rule for you if a bureaucrat has interpreted the law against you. Your right to an independent judge and a jury goes away. I have to defer, so the bureaucrats tell me, to agencies in their interpretation of the law. Chief Justice Marshall, the great Chief Justice at the beginning of our country, said it is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is. What happens when bureaucrats instead of judges get to decide your rights? They're responsive to politics. 
They're responsive to lobbying by vested and large interests. Well, the big guys, they can take care of themselves in that process. They can capture the agency. They can buy their lobbyists. They have all those perfume lawyers. What about the rest of us? What about that veteran? What about that immigrant? That's why the separation of powers I came to see matters. It's what protects your liberty. The problem is it only is going to survive if you want it to. It's like all our rights. And I think Ronald Reagan said, you know, freedom's only one generation away from being extinguished, something like that. This stuff isn't going to be protected forever unless you want it to be, and you make it happen. First three words of the Constitution are, we the people. It's up to you to keep it. One of the keys you point to in the book for strengthening separation of powers is sort of um, a real fidelity to originalism. Uh, why do you think that's so important? So originalism sounds pretty wonky, doesn't it? I try and explain in the book why not only isn't it wonky, but you need to know about it. And it matters to your rights, your children's rights. So what is originalism? It's really pretty simple. It's the view that the, the document of the Constitution, like any other law, should be interpreted according to the, its original public meaning. That the words on the page should mean the same today as they did 200 years ago, and they should mean the same always. The meaning of Shakespeare's sonnets doesn't change. I don't get to make up new versions of it, and neither should I be able to make up or evolve the Constitution. <coughs> That's a pretty simple idea. It's, in fact, the Supreme Court of the United States has said probably 100 times if it said it once, that that's how we interpret statutes and contracts according to their original public meaning. Why would the Constitution be any different? Our founders took the trouble of writing our Constitution down. They rejected the English model of an unwritten Constitution. So I think originalism respects the writtenness of the Constitution and the limited role of the judge in a republic. The alternative is this, what they call this living constitution. Now that sounds a lot better than originalism, originalism. I mean, we gotta come up with a better label. Living constitution. What, I, I, I like dead constitutions? <laughs> no, I love our constitution. All right, so Here's what happens, though, when you go down the living Constitution road. And I didn't, I didn't know any of this when I was, these, these guys are so far ahead of me, that's why I got optimism. When I was in law school, they didn't even use the word originalism in law school classes. They didn't teach it. I first heard it from Justice Scalia when he came to speak when he was a young justice about my age now. <laughs> Yikes. And it was a breath of fresh air. And it really got me to thinking. But what really persuaded me was, again, being a lawyer and a judge and seeing what happens when you go down the other way, just like when you start bleeding the separation of powers. Here's what happens when you go down the living Constitution road. First thing that happens, you start losing your rights. Let me give you some examples. Take the Sixth Amendment. All right? It says you've got a right to a jury trial in a criminal case. It says you have a right to confront the witnesses against you. Now, it does not take the world's most sophisticated originalist to understand those words. Living constitutionalists, though, in the Supreme Court of the United States have held that sometimes you don't have a right to a judge in a criminal case that may expose you to many years more in prison. And your right to confrontation, living constitutionalists have held Sometimes. And sometimes a piece of paper written by a police officer that you can't cross-examine can be enough to send you to prison for decades. Because there are more important things than the right to confrontation. There are more important things than your right to a trial by jury. Well, maybe they think so, but the founders didn't. It's not what we agreed to in the Constitution. All right. Then they start putting stuff in there that isn't in there. That's the other part of it. Not only do they take stuff away, then they start adding stuff. 
like Dred Scott, again. Where the heck did the right to own slaves in the territory come from? It ain't in the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. I'm pretty sure of that. But they put it there. Korematsu. <clears throat> Where's the right to round up Japanese American citizens without any semblance of due process? Let's just stick that in there, too. Originalism honors the Constitution that was adopted. Is it a perfect Constitution? I'm not here to tell you everything's perfect. You know, it, did, it didn't allow women the right to vote, the original Constitution, and slavery was permissible in the southern states. But we, the people, changed that through the amendment process. And that is the appropriate way to change the Constitution. Not nine older <laughs> people sitting in Washington. That's not what we, the people, agreed to. And then I hear sometimes it leads to conservative results or something. Rubbish. Have the results I've talked about sounded conservative to you, politically? Is the right to a trial by jury conservative? Is refusing to recognize a right to own slaves in the territories conservative? This has nothing to do with politics. This has everything to do with preserving, conserving, I'll admit, our Constitution. That's what originalism is about. You say in the book that two tools of legal interpretation that are true to the role of a judge in uh, our Constitution are both originalism and textualism. Talk about the importance of textualism, particularly in a statutory state we live in. Yeah, textualism is just the same thing for originalism. Is, you know, don't make stuff up. I have two rules for my law clerks. They come in at the beginning of the year, they're all cheerful and happy, and I say, listen, <laughs> we're going to have a great year together. It's going to be fun. But I just ask you to abide two simple rules when it comes to statutes in particular, the rest of it. Rule number one, don't make stuff up. <laughs> just follow the words on the page, right? And number two, when you're tempted, because the rule's stupid, the law's dumb, or someone's pressuring you, or somebody wrote a nasty editorial in some newspaper, or they're saying they won't invite you to their cocktail parties if you don't make it up. Do me a favor, refer back to rule number one. <laughs> That's all textualism is. You know, sometimes a judge knows about three things. Justice Scalia used to say something like this. It's so true. Number one, this statute is really dumb. The American people's representatives have enacted what I think to be, personally, I think to be a stupid law. Number two, it's a constitutional law. And number three, when I do my job as a judge and enforce this stupid but constitutional law, everybody who's not a lawyer is going to think I'm pretty stupid too. Okay. That's what textualism is about, is you want to change the law? Don't ask nine people to do it, because they're going to do it however they want. Go across the street to the Capitol building, to your elected representatives. That's where you're supposed to change the law. It's not my job to do their job. That's what textualism is about. In chapter four, you pose a question about when judges should follow or overrule decisions which they think were mistaken. And your short answer is, it's not always and it's not never. Can you unpack that a little bit? Oh, yeah, I know. The people, people today, I, I mean, I, I, I love this. You know, and they say, you voted to overrule precedent. You're a terrible person. Huh, a lot of that. And then in the next breath, they'll say, and I want you to overrule this one and that one. <laughs> okay? Everybody's got their favorite cases and the cases they hate. Everybody. Let's be honest. Everybody. All right? So if you're telling me precedent should always be respected, I'd say, really? You want me to keep Dred Scott on the books then? You'd like me to keep Korematsu on the books? One of my favorite things that happened the last two and a half years 
So we got to overrule Korematsu formally. I am not ashamed of overruling precedent like that. And so the answer has to be not never and not always. And the question then becomes when. And that's hard. And I can't give you a mathematical formula for that. That's judgment. Right? That's legal judgment. It's not a bad place to start, though, by asking how well reasoned is that opinion? How faithful is it to the original understanding of the Constitution? There are other questions you have to ask, too. That's a pretty good place to start. You have an interesting exchange with Senator Sass uh, in the book that you reference, um, where you really try to draw a distinction between the judge and a legislator. Uh, and this is a theme that keeps coming up uh, in the book, of sort of this notion of a judge. Um, and, and you even talk about qualities in a judge uh, uh, about whom Judge William Holloway, there's a, a, a series named after. You talk about judicial virtues and avoiding judicial vices. Can you talk about some of those? So the bit with Senator Sass was, you know, he was asking me, how do you want to be remembered? And I, I said something along these lines. I want to be forgotten. <laughs> I think I really meant it right about then. <laughs> um, but I, I do mean it, that, that we remember presidents and we remember our elected leaders for good reasons. Um, they make the laws. They do war. They do peace. What's a judge supposed to do? A good judge. A judge is supposed to take the, this wonderful inheritance of our Constitution and our rule of law, which is so strong, and make sure that it's handed down to the next generation. That's it. Not to, not to exercise personal will, but legal judgment. And so a good judge probably should be forgotten pretty quickly, is what I told him. I don't think he was expecting that answer. But I had in mind my old boss, Byron White, who was the first justice from Colorado. And I had clerked for him, and he was my childhood hero. He led the NCAA in rushing and graduated first in his class from the University of Colorado, first in his class from Yale Law School, led the NFL in rushing, and was the highest paid football player of his day. Rhodes Scholar, Bronze Star winner, buddy of Jack Kennedy, helped desegregate the southern schools with Bobby Kennedy, and served on the United States Supreme Court for 31 years. Wow. I remember vividly as a law clerk walking with him down the hallway in the Supreme Court where all the old justices' portraits hang one day. And he asked me, so how many of these cats can you actually identify? And <laughs> in a fit of honesty, I said, about half. And then he said something that really surprised me. He said, me too. <laughs> And I'll be forgotten soon enough as well. And that's exactly how it should be. And I thought that was really sad at the moment. At that time, I thought that was really heartbreaking. And I thought that was also impossible. Nobody would ever forget Byron White. How could they? He had the coolest 20th century life possible. I thought, still do. I now walk down that hallway daily, and I see tourists staring quizzically and wondering who old, that old man was. He was exactly right. And he was trying to teach me something that wasn't dark or unhappy for him. It was a joyful truth. Joyful. Here is a guy who could have made a fortune as a football player, as a lawyer, and instead he walked around with stains on his tie and an old ratty jacket because he loved this country and he knew that the real joy in life lies in doing something that's greater than yourself. And what greater thing can you do than live a life upholding and bequeathing our Constitution? That's a great privilege and joy. Yeah, so. e you talk about we, how we have the greatest legal system in history but you also say it's not without its flaws or shortcomings. 
Uh, one of those that you point to is a sort of access to justice issue. Do you mind talking a little bit about why that's important to you? Sure. And I want to say why I'm optimistic about that. Please. All right. So uh, I, I talk about access to justice in the book. I, you know, as optimistic as I am, you know, it'd be foolhardy to say that we don't have some problems, right? Lawyers are way too expensive. Heck, I couldn't even afford my services <laughs> as a lawyer. Can you afford your hourly rate? No. <laughs> All right? Um, it, it takes way too long to get to trial. It's way too expensive. When you get there, you don't get a jury. And then just about everything under the sun is criminal. So about everybody over 18, I've got a lot of professor friends who say, I pretty much guarantee everybody over 18 in this country has committed a federal crime. That's crazy. We have tr people who call themselves trial lawyers who've never tried a case. We have something called discovery that takes forever, all right? So we used to have trials without this discovery process. Now we have discovery without trials. These trial lawyers don't try cases, but they can write interrogatories to one another in iambic pentameter. <laughs> all right, we got, we got a lot of problems, all right? And I got, I got some ideas about how to solve some of my offer in the book, but I'm, I'm no expert. I've got a few thoughts. Why do we all have to have three years of law school? So these kids wind up with a mountain of debt, and they can't afford to be Main Street lawyers. They all have to go work for corporate clients. I'm not sure we need three years of law school. Why do we prevent anyone who isn't a lawyer from doing even the simplest legal things, like helping you with a will or an uncontested divorce? I wonder about that. Our rules, our, judges, our judicial rules, we've created this system where we don't have trials anymore. Maybe everybody should have a right to a trial within six months. How about that? So some of the, some of the, those are some of the ideas I explore in the book on access to justice. But here's why I'm confident that we're doing okay, all right? And I, and I, and I don't mean this in, in, in a Pollyannish sense. But I look around the world, and there's some wonderful countries with great rule of law. I'm, I don't deny it. But I think if you spent six weeks in the courts of any other country in the world, pretty much of your choice, and come back home, you'd say, there are some other great countries, for sure, but we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And people say, well, the Supreme Court, these five, four decisions, and you know, they get depressed. And you know, here's, here's some facts, all right? Let's get past the clickbait, all right, and get to the real facts. I think we lose sight about the rule of law in this country when we focus on a tree or even a needle of the tree rather than the forest. There are 50 million cases filed in this country every year. We're a litigious bunch. Supposed to be. It's a raucous republic. That's all right. That's fine. More business. Now, I'm not including your traffic tickets or your speeding tickets. That's about another 50 million. <laughs> 50 million lawsuits. Now, I'm going to move to the federal system because I know these numbers by heart. 95% of the cases filed in the federal system are resolved by the trial judge and jury without further appeal. Now, I represented a lot of unhappy litigants. If you're a lawyer for any amount of time, you have your losses to show for it. But my clients would accept the fact that they've been heard, a neutral person had adjudicated it, and it was reasonably fair even if they didn't like the outcome. That's a testament to the strength of the rule of law in this country in my mind. All right, what about those 5% that wind up on appeal? My old circuit, the 10th Circuit, we covered 20% of the continental United States two time zones. Ninth Circuit's maybe even bigger, I don't know. Huge. S sit in panels of three. Appointed by presidents from President Obama all the way back to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, Judge Holloway. He was appointed to the court the year after I was born. <laughs> the Tenth Circuit is as diverse a court on any metric you wish to consider as, as, you, as, as, you, as any court in the country, I think. You pick the metric. We were able to reach unanimous agreement on our cases 95% of the time. Unanimous, those 5%. OK, you say, well, what about the Supreme Court? I say, all right, fine, let's, let's deal with that. We hear 70 cases a year, folks. 
I'll add 50 million, okay? That's it. And they're the hardest cases. And they're the ones where the lower court judges have disagreed. And not disagreed just a little bit, because my law clerks will say, well, if it's just a little disagreement, let it percolate. <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> my coffee percolate. My coffee doesn't even percolate anymore. <laughs> Used to. But how does a circuit split percolate? Anyway, fine. Let it develop further, all right? We only hear the ones where there's really endemic disagreement. And there are nine of us, nine, appointed by five different presidents over 25 years from all across the country. Well, New York's pretty heavily represented. <laughs> <laughs> Not so many of us from the West. Uh, fine, nine of us. Get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch. <laughs> right? Let alone the hardest cases in the whole country. Out of that 70 cases, 40% of them we resolve unanimously, all nine of us. And that number has been constant since 1945. Now back then, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had appointed eight of the nine justices of the United States Supreme Court. And they couldn't do any better than we're doing now. And then the really cynical among us will say, yeah, 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 but what about the five to fours? I say, okay, we moved from the forest to the trees, to the branch, and now we're on the needles. That's only about 25 to 33% of our docket every year. That's it. And that percentage has remained constant since the Second World War II. Roosevelt's court couldn't do any better than us either. And last term, those five to four decisions, there were 10 different combinations of justices in those five to four decisions. Where do you read about that? Yeah. The only thing that's new is that nothing is new. <laughs> the rule of law in this country is strong. Think about how predictable, how solid, how reliable the rule of law is given those numbers, those facts. I'm very proud to serve as part of it. Small cog in that machinery of justice in this country. Very proud. You've taught a course in legal ethics to law students, and in it you have them write their obituaries. Can you talk a little about why you do that and what you hope to instill in them through that, that exercise? Sure. Um, it's kind of a corny exercise, isn't it? But at the end of the semester, I asked them to spend five minutes writing their obituaries. I used to. And they'd start snickering at first. And then as they started writing it, the room grew very, very quiet. And then at the end of it, I'd ask them to please read if they would be so brave. And a few brave souls would, would agree to do it. And I'll tell you, in, I don't know, 10 years or whatever it was of teaching that class, not once did I hear a student brag about how much money they had made, that their name was on the law firm door, that they were the biggest rainmaker at the firm, that they billed the most hours, that they had the fastest car, biggest house, whatever. They always talked about about three or four things. They were good in their family life. They were kind to their friends. They did something for their community. And some of them talked about their faith. And so I tell them at the end of the semester, stick that thing in your desk drawer. Keep it in your desk drawer. And when you're feeling blue, or when you're wondering how you're doing in life's journey, pull that out and see how you're doing on the metrics that really matter. And the idea came to me because, well, many, many reasons, but one of them is, as a law student, I came across an epitaph of an old lawyer from the founding era in Boston, old Granary burial grounds. Paul Revere is buried, a lot of famous men. This was not a famous man. And the epitaph I just thought was beautiful. 
and it talked about being dignified and firm in public life and calm and affectionate in private life. And I reprint it in the book because I keep that on my desk. Um, and then I tell young people, don't be afraid. I think it's hard. You guys live in a social media age where anything you do or say can be criticized, where cyberbullying is a real thing. And it's hard to step forward to do public service. But you know what? The words don't hurt. I'm still here. <laughs> right? And we need you guys to be true to your obituaries, all right? And step forward and be part of the solution. Somebody has to run the zoo. I'd like it to be you. You talked earlier about Justice White. Uh, you also clearly, in reading the book, have a fondness for Justice Kennedy. Um, and am I correct in saying that you were the first justice-justice uh, uh, combo where one clerked for the other on the court? Yes. Um, share a little bit about your, your um, uh, affection for Justice Kennedy. Well, Justice Kennedy is a role model for me when it comes to the things we've just been talking about, civics and civility. A kinder person you will not meet. A gentler man does not exist. Um, here's, here's a story emblematic of him. So back when I was a law clerk, um, we'd fax him out opinions to his house. He worked at home a lot. A terrible time reading his handwriting, especially those old fax paper. You remember that? Oh, God. At any rate, I come to the court now as a law clerk, as a justice after being his law clerk, and he says, now, Neil, you might remember, I, I work a lot from home. I find fewer people bother me there. He was right. Uh, the, the, the visitation rate to the Supreme Court of Coloradans has, I think, spiked precipitously since I, um, I everybody I know, and it's been great. I love it. But I get more work done at home. He's right. He said, now, if you talk to our IT people and ask nicely, they'll help you set up a home office, and they'll put a fax machine in for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's still using the fax machine. And so my very first opinion for the court I had been assigned was not the world's most difficult opinion. And, uh, and it was likely to garner a quick nine votes and get out the door promptly. The justice wanted to be the first to join. And so he asked his law clerk, to fax it out to him. I'd circulated it late in the day and he'd left. So he's at home, but he wanted to get in his vote that evening. Well, that old fax machine broke down that day. <laughs> so he asked his law clerk to drive out to his house so he could read it. And he did. And he sent back, he did not want to wait another minute, let alone to the next morning. He sent back a handwritten joinder notes so that he'd be the first to join. That's Anthony Kennedy. That's, he's a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. Another justice did something for you that was special um, in giving you a gift when you started on the court, Justice Ginsburg. What did she return to you from so many years before? Uh, so yeah, um, I, when I was Justice White's law clerk and he was retiring, his successor was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So when I was a law clerk, she was starting her career. And um, Justice White had over the years, compiled a manual for his law clerks on office procedures. It was kind of messy. And he kind of put it together in pretty form, and he sent it off to, to, to Ruth with a note, typically like Byron White, modest. Here's my law clerk manual. I don't know if you'll find it of any use, but I pass it along because I don't need it anymore. <laughs> and within the first week of my arrival at the court, I get a note. And it says, dear Neil, you might recognize, something like this, you might recognize some of this. Byron White gave it to me. I'm handing it back to you. I hope I've made a few improvements along the way. <laughs> As indeed she had. 
We have time for one more question before I ask the justice the question. Uh, we'll thank him at the end, but I would like to ask everyone. Uh, he has a plane to catch, so he will be quickly escorted out through the back. And please, everyone stay seated and allow him to expedite his process as he's been spending a lot of time with us tonight. We want to make sure he stays on track. Uh, in the book, you talk a lot about in that transition from judge to justice and from relative anonymity to uh, uh, being more well recognized that it was it was a trying process, but one thing that really kept you going and inspired you was people's love of country, and that came out to you in many different ways during that process. Maybe share some final concluding reflections on uh, how your, your fellow citizens kind of lifted you up during that, that time. Oh, in, in so many ways. Um, the little girl on the airplane. Nice woman who watched the confirmation hearings and said that my socks were falling down. <laughs> so she sent me a package of new ones. <laughs> Friends and family from every part of my life just appearing magically, unasked, unbidden, <laughs> to help in any way they could every day. People quit their jobs moved to Washington, family members sitting behind me at the confirmation hearing. I didn't know they were coming to Washington. They just wanted to know that there was me to know that they were there behind me. I don't know, this is just me. I'm, some places and some times in life you can feel the power of prayer. I, I, I feel like I can. And I really felt an incredible power of prayer around me from my family and my friends and so many Americans across the country during that period. And I still do. And it is incredibly humbling and an incredible honor to serve. And I want to thank each of you for allowing me that privilege. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Two notes. First of all, will you join me in thanking Dean Matt Parlow for doing a fine job tonight? <laughs> then I'd, uh, I'd like to invite some of you back on Friday night because this man, Jack Brennan, Colonel Jack Brennan, standing on the corner over here. Put up your hand, Jack. We have the first Jack Brennan, Colonel Jack Brennan, distinguished leader lecture by none other than General Jim Mattis on Friday night. So thank you, safe travels, good night.